So in today's video, I wanna talk about the state of the racket industry. I think rackets are as good as they've ever been. It's like we don't even see bad rackets being produced anymore. Almost everything is at least decently playable. Nothing is gonna jar your arm, vibrate your elbow out of its socket. And I don't even see things that are insanely launchy, like a racket that I love, the SV95. This was a great racket, really strong all around playability, but it did have a hot spot right kind of here in the strain bed where if you hit it there, it would cannonball out. Those kind of obvious flaws, we don't see those in rackets as much as they used to. Overall playability has a very high floor. It's like rackets are all Alex de Minaur. They're all pretty decent, but it's pretty hard to find one where even on its best day, it's gonna beat the top player in the world. And I kind of think this is a bit of a problem. It's not that the racket industry isn't as exciting as maybe it once was, it's that there seems to be a bit of a lack of personality with these rackets that are coming out and almost a lack of vision for how different rackets should differentiate themselves from each other. Take the new CXs, for example. Here I have the CX200, and here I have the CX400 Tour. As you know, I really enjoy this 200. I think it has a bit of an obvious flaw with how low the swing weight is, and I appreciate that they took a risk there. I really like the feel. I think the feel has decent character, especially compared to modern rackets. It's super fast through the air, insanely spin friendly. Like the amount of spin this thing generates is among the best towards the Extreme Tour, the VCore 98, the Shift 300. That's how good this thing is for spin. On the other hand, we have the CX400 Tour. Really bad for spin. Better than the Blade 98 V9s for sure, but considering it's a 100 square inch racket, you would think it would give you a little bit more loop on the ball than it really does. So here's what I don't like about the identity of these two rackets. They look almost exactly the same, same paint job that from the same family, from the same manufacturer. Yet this one is super light. It's made for an insane spin player like me, who kind of maybe has jank technique. Whereas this one feels like it's for a completely different audience. The CX400 Tour is slower through the air. It's way more stable. It's a lot heavier in terms of swing weight, 20 points higher for the 100 square inch version that's supposed to be easier to use. It's a bit of a weird situation for me. I way prefer the CX200 on my forehand. The 400 Tour, it's a backhand racket for me all day long. Some of the less good slices on the market, some of the absolute best slices on the market. So in terms of playability, it's like here, there's very little overlap despite these rackets being part of the exact same family. And I'm wondering, where's the vision with these two rackets? Did it just happen that they group tested these with a bunch of random players and took the average of the feedback so we don't see this kind of cohesive identity behind each racket line. That's kind of what it feels like to me. These feel like crowdsourced rackets that were developed for the tastes of the average player. And talking to the Slinko Whiteouts engineer, that's exactly how Slinko is developing these rackets. Even though I love my Whiteout here, which does need new grommets, and this is one of the most unique playing rackets on the market, in my opinion, in terms of how much vibration it transmits through the frame. This was a racket that was designed and it was crowdsourced. This was designed for the preferences of the average advanced player. There's no target ideas. There's no mastermind behind the frame. And I understand why that is. They want to sell as many rackets as they can. They want to make the average player happy. But what I'm seeing with all these rackets coming in is there's so little to differentiate the products. Everyone is going towards this most average possible racket. We're seeing less weight options than we used to. Bablat doesn't make a super light pure arrow anymore. I don't think there's a pure arrow tour in the heavier weight like there used to be. How many rackets do you know of that are over 315 grams? I can think of three. The Prestige Pro, 
the RF-97, which is arguably doesn't even count because they're technically not currently selling that. And then the Percept, the two Percept models, the H and the D. And sure, that could, you could say that's a reflection of the top performers in our sport. We're now seeing pros using lighter and lighter rackets. But then here's my next question. If we shouldn't have followed the pros into this territory of using super heavy rackets like Djokovic and Nadal, who are using 360 plus swing weights in really heavy static weights, why are we also now following the pros into going lower and lower swing weight? Where's the logic? Do we follow the pros and the pro setups or do we not follow the pros and chase our own setups? I personally, when I was setting up my rackets, I was influenced by the pros. That's one of the reasons I went heavier. But last summer in searching for my own spec, I found going to a heavier racket actually raised my floor. It didn't feel like I had to play, you know, eight out of 10 tennis to have a decent day on court. When I was really trying to make the commit to the switch with the stock VCore 98, I needed to be at an eight out of 10 day to have any fun on court. But if I was having anything less than that, my feet were a little bit slow, maybe, maybe I'm tired because I did editing all day. My eyes aren't tracking the ball as precisely as they need to be. That means I'm going to be out of position on a lot of shots. And with these lighter rackets, if you're out of position, you can't generate that quite that same swing speed. It's hard to find margin. It's hard to find depth. It's hard to even clear the net sometimes. So looking at that now, since maximum swing speeds aren't going to be the answer for me, they might not be the answer for you either. And to the opposite, they might definitely be the answer for you. It just depends on what you like. If you haven't noticed, I am just ad-libbing this thing. I've had a lot of these ideas in my head and I just couldn't get them out on script. So I thought, eh, let's just rant about it and see how things turn out. And as we're seeing all these kind of rackets go towards more average and average specs, we're also seeing kind of a new class of racket emerge, which is like this control, medium control oriented 100 score incher. I think the speeds were really the first to do it, but now we're seeing like this 400 tour. We're also seeing like the Percept 100 and the 100D specifically, even the Pro Staffs have moved to the 100 square inch with the Pro Staff X. But the thing is, how often do you actually see those rackets on court? I haven't seen any Pro Staff Xs other than the one that I bought and sold my friend. In Canada, we're not even getting a lot of these rackets. We're not getting the Percept 100D. I don't even think we're getting the Blade 100, which has been really positively received outside of my racket realm, which is mostly just me and Luca from Rackets and Runners. We don't get to, we just don't get to try a lot of this stuff, but I'm not even sure I really want to try a lot of this stuff. How many kind of like slightly more control 100 score inch average stiffness rackets do I really want to try? What I'm looking for is new experiences. I want to see racket manufacturers push the envelope, find a target player demographic, and go after it. Another racket that I think has really lost a lot of its mojo, which makes no sense because this is one of the best selling rackets of all time, is the Babylon Pure Arrow. The Arrow Pro drives were amazing for spin. The other day, Simon and I took out my old GT. It's so much more connected. It swings so much faster than the current generation Pure Arrow 100. And I think part of that is because the twist weight on these new arrows is so high. It's really hard to go from this kind of set position into doing this motion to get your whip up the back of the ball. And when you're a spin player, maybe a player who would be considering the most famous spin racket of all time, you really, it's critical to be able to adjust the angle of your racket face as you're swinging to get that right topspin application. This is why we see Nadal sticking with this lower twist weight from his older racket. That guy needs to make more adjustments during his swing because he has some of the highest swing speeds and the thinnest contact points. But maybe that's just me. Maybe it's because I got old man technique now that I'm 27 years old. Maybe all these kids are gonna be swinging like Alcaraz right through that ball. But maybe not because guess what? Sinner, this is Sinner's racket set up to his weight setup, speed GT. 
sure, it's kind of like another one of these average medium control 100s that I just whined about for five minutes. But this thing has a unique identity. This thing swings so uniquely. There is nothing that swings like the Graphing Touch Speed MP today. The way it comes through contact is so fast, it's so violent. If you don't stay on the gas at all time, the ball will sail. You won't get the spin you need. And maybe that's not that interesting to a lot of people, but this is a pretty popular mold. I think Andrescu uses this mold, Sinner uses this mold. This is a decent racket, and it's a racket that has personality. And honestly, there's not that many rackets, I think, that have personalities these days. I think the Slinka Whiteout, I think the Slinka Whiteout has great personality. I think the new Vcore 95 has great personality, despite the fact that it's a little bit muted. But these best sellers, like the Ezo 98, the Pure Arrows, the Blades, they don't have this kind of personality to where like you would want to have a beer with them if they were your friend. It's more like they're a customer service rep who, yeah, they did a good job. They sold you the pants you want in your size. Maybe they even, maybe they even gave you 10% off because you were a really nice customer, which is not true. These racket manufacturers have just been jacking prices up over the last like two years since COVID hit. But let's say they do. These rackets, I don't, I just don't think that these are rackets that you want to hang out with over the long period of time. I don't know, I want to see something unique, I want to see something fiery, I want to see something almost flawed in the same way that we are, to find this kind of human connection with these rackets. And I, it's not something we see. Strings, on the other hand, I think strings are pretty exciting right now. I've personally been so much more into what's going on with strings than I have been with rackets. I think even the major manufacturers are putting out some weird stuff like Luxlon's Eco line. I saw Gamma also did Gamma Sapphire, which is supposed to be recycled plastic. Whether that's actually good for the environment or just greenwashing, I don't really know. But on the odd chance that it is a little bit more beneficial, I'm all about that. And I know I'm biased, but I also really like what Toroline is doing. Yes, I am also confused about how many new strings come out all the time, it seems like, by them. And how still there's not quite enough product differentiation between the different strings that Toroline produces. Yes, I know they all feel similarly muted, a little bit more plasticky, ultra soft gear towards spin. But that's hot right now. I love the risks they're taking with the cool colors. I think the thing with the poly poly hybriding is super cool. That's what I've been having fun with. I have not really been having as much fun testing rackets other than this CX200. That's the first racket I had fun testing since my whiteout. But the thing with Toro line is I talked to the guy. I said, listen, man, you're putting out too much. People can't keep up, everything plays almost the same. And he's like, you know what, Beckett, I hear ya. We do make a lot of strings, but I'm a tennis nerd. I love tennis, I love trying new stuff. I put in a lot of my personal creativity into developing every new string that comes out. And I'm a tennis nerd, I just want to see people excited about the products that I'm producing, and that's why I keep putting stuff out. I love when people share their passions like that. I love what Toroline is doing. It's a really passionate company. You can tell, do all their strings work for me? Absolutely not. I'm really struggling to, to hybrid them with other brands. I find the Toroline hybrids work really well. They play nice with each other in terms of spin, but it's, they're so soft. It's like as soon as I put something stiffer in the main, it just locks up the string bed. I don't get the same kind of spin. I don't get the same kind of power. I don't get the same kind of predictability. All right, my camera overheated. So I'm just gonna finish this now. I wanna know what you think about the tennis racket industry. Are you happy with where things are at? What are you concerned about? What do you think is the most exciting brand in terms of rackets? I think 
the company that's doing it best right now is I really like the Slinko stuff, but I understand that's too hard for people to get. And I think that lack of distribution is going to be a negative factor. I think Yonix is probably doing it best. They make the fewest annoying rackets in terms of like, what's the vision for this racket? They have even less variation in terms of swing weight, which is a little bit frustrating. I wish they would produce a, a 98 kind of in the 330 range but maybe that's for next season. Who do I think is doing it worse right now? Wilson, without a doubt. Horrible differentiation. There's way too much overlap between the pro stuff and the blade. I don't see anyone using Ultra 100s. Their labs stuff like the, H the Blade Pros, the Ultra Pros, that stuff is cool, but it's not attainable for the average person. You know that I don't like the shift, but I appreciate the risk they took on that racket. The Clash, I heard, is not selling at all with the V2 because everyone who needed a Clash bought the V1 and they're not gonna upgrade on the next cycle. Interesting to see what kind of happens with the Clash in its third iteration. And let me know what string company you think is the most exciting. Like I said, I think, well, no, I love this restring sync. It's played so well in every racket, but I've tried, but I really like the creativity Taraline is working with but I still think Grapple Snake makes on average the highest quality strings out there. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next time.